draftsmanship is, I feel, very important. Um, you want to paint loose, but it, you need to have a, a pretty good handle on your design going in before you start. You have to have a real clear vision of what you're trying to accomplish. And for me, having a, a sketch uh, down on the paper first, sometimes it's a little over uh, detailed. And I won't, I won't get too bogged down in a lot of detail when I start painting. But what it does is it gives me an opportunity to really study my shapes. And today's lesson um, is really important. I'm, I'm going to let Lois flip over to the, uh, the, the screen that shows the painting, this uh, composition. But what I did is I'm going to take the, the sketch away and show you my drawing. My focus on all the shapes. You've probably heard me say this, or if you've heard other tutors talk about this, variety is so important in your shapes. You don't wanna have a repetition of the same shape over and over again. So even my strong negative shapes of the rooftops are distinctly different in scale and shape. They interlock. So I consciously have planned so that my white negative shapes of the snow covered rooftops have a way to feed one into the next. So I don't have any separation. Then I come back into the sides of the buildings and I wanna make sure that I've got snow drifts and things that are along the base of the building that create variety. And then the space in between the telephone poles and the rooftops and the fence posts all have their own individual shape. So if you're looking at your drawing and you see that you've got a lot of repetition or that these spaces along the side of the barn are all basically the same proportion and scale. Take your eraser right now before we get started and maybe shift a fence post over. I put a lot of verticals into my painting and these are going to be negative shapes. I'm gonna protect them, the white of them. I'll come back in and put some darks where there's a light background. I'll leave them white where there's a dark background. But what they do is they create a rhythm that goes through your painting. And I'm always looking for an opportunity to create a strong rhythm that is kind of counterbalanced by the bass notes or the heavy notes of the darks. And my darks are gonna be the sides of these buildings that are in shadow. And they're gonna be a very strong, warm dark, but they get broken up by these verticals. So I put a lot of thought into my composition. And that's why I do value studies. Somebody asked earlier why I had cross hatching and I don't wanna get bogged down in a lot of detail when I'm doing value studies, but I want to think through the process so that I'm more or less kind of painting it in my head. And it just makes a difference in um, clarifying where I'm going to ultimately end up with a finished product. You, you have to have an end game or a destination in mind uh, before you start. Because if you just start throwing your know, brush down on the paper without a lot of pre-thought, the odds of, of arriving at um, a good finished painting uh, gets diminished quite a bit. So today, I, I'm going to do start with my sky. And one of the things I thought about this morning as I was waiting for our, our class to begin, no matter what painting I do, when I do a sky, I want there to be movement across that sky. What does that mean? Movement is going from light to dark, from cool to warm, uh, creating gradations, anything that, that subtly changes that shape as it moves across a painting creates interest. If you look at your any sky, no matter where you are in the world, it's a rare day that we have a sky that's exactly a, a bright blue from the horizon all the way up to the top of the sky. It's, it's, there's always variation. And you're gonna hear me say this over and over and over again, whether it's shapes, whether it's washes, whatever it is, we always want to strive towards introducing variation in our painting. So skies are important. I'm gonna back up my camera a bit and uh, show you a couple things. I'm gonna, just because they're, they're nice workhorses, I use a bigger flat to start wetting my, uh, my sky. I also stick a couple of rolls of tape under my board so I have an angle to my board. That allows gravity to pull that paint that's wet downward. It smooths out any brush strokes. 
Anytime gravity takes a wet brush stroke and, and pulls it down across another brush stroke, it smooths it out. It makes it very gentle and a nice uh, atmospheric approach. Now, um, see if I can get that. There you go. Got a little bit better uh, focus. See if I can get my camera straight. Uh, I'm going to take this, this flat brush that I've got, and I'm going to make sure that I preserve the areas that are around the, uh, the, the telephone poles, the tree trunks, the, the rooftops. I want to protect that white. Now, having a, an angle like this on my board, all that water is going to come down and bead up right along the top of this roof line. So I have to kind of wash that. You might want to take one of the rolls of tape out so it isn't running so fast while you're wetting your surface, but you will be able to get a nice wet surface for a wet and wet approach. This is another reason I use a flat brush is I can go right up against an edge and I can move very quickly and just use the flat and the sharp corners to, to move that wet into these, these areas without getting bogged down with a lot of futz, uh, you know, futzing and, and picking with the, uh, the brush. So a big, broad, flat brush allows me to, to cover a lot of ground very quickly. Coming down, I may not cover up all the pencil lines on the roof lines because I can take a brush and pull that paint down to that when I'm started to introduce color. But for now, all I want to do is get this surface fairly wet so that I can start mixing up my, my pigments. Now, what I want to do to start off, this is going to be a cool painting. So I'm going to get my, my palette over here and mix up a little bit of the lavender, a little bit of cobalt. The lavender kind of gives that cobalt a less of an intense, uh, harsh circus blue. Um, I'm going to add just a touch of the uh, the bright violet just to kind of warm up some of that blue a little bit. You can see what it does. It just makes a really nice deal. Now, I don't have to get too wet because of my paper's already wet. So I'm just getting a nice charge of paint in this flat brush so that I've got lots of paint. One of the things people don't take the time to do is work all that paint thoroughly into their brush. And then what happens is they've got a big chunk of one color on a corner, and then it leaves a big stripe in the middle of their, uh, their painting. So work it in really well in your mixing well, then come back, we'll get back over here and get started. Now we're gonna end up just laying down a lot of pigment here to start with. We'll come back in and start charging these washes with additional colors. We want to get really strong darks right down into the uh, edges up against the, um, the, the barns, the rooftops. But for now, I just want to get a nice crisp negative shape here for my telephone poles using this flat brush and just filling in. I've got it's already granulating a bit. I'm going to add a little bit of cerulean to some of this just up in here. And then as we get over in the middle of the painting, I just might want to add a little bit more water to my brush so that it becomes not quite as intense as, as over on the left side of the painting. Where it goes behind the telephone pole, I want to maintain that same value so it feels like it's going right behind the pole. But then as I move to the right, I start introducing just a touch more water. And it gets a little lighter up against where I'm going to have these really dark treetops. So we'll just pull this on across. I'm going to introduce just a touch of yellow okra in here just to add a little bit of warmth into some of that sky. And because it's such a lake full of water on the paper surface, it doesn't really matter where I put it because it's going to flow and fill in wherever it wants. And that's the the that's what the beauty of watercolor is you don't have a lot of control. You you know where you can place the brush, but once it's placed, the water and the pigment kind of have a life of their own and they start taking off and doing their own thing. And that's what's so unique and makes this a fun medium to work in because it's uh, kind of risky. And we have to be willing to take a few risks and enjoy the process. I'm gonna put a little bit more warmth over here with the bright uh, violet. 
and a little bit more cobalt to that. So you can see I'm mixing it up. And you can see it's all starting to bead up against the, uh, the edge of the rooftop. So now I'm going to wipe my brush off on a rag. So it's damp, but it's not real wet. And I can wick up some of this bead of water and just wipe it off on a brush. And then it won't bloom and create a havoc with my sky. I'm just literally kind of slurping up this little bead of extra water because I'm going to come back in and add some darks, but I, I just want to make sure that I have an even amount of water on the surface of this sky. And I just, it's, you have to continue to go back and wipe the moisture off your brush, otherwise you won't be able to continue wicking this up. Um, so now I've got a, a nice start, but I want to add some more color. So let's, let's think about what we can add now. I want to put in maybe a little bit of green or turquoise. Let's add a little bit of turquoise to this. See what happens when we add that cobalt light turquoise in here. And you can see it's still so wet that when I just touch this with my brush with a little bit of pigment on it, it just slightly uh, enriches this, the wash with just a little bit of color. This is called charging your wash with a secondary color, which is what I'm doing. And then um, I'm going to cool this off with a little bit of cobalt and raw umber. Look at this. This raw umber adds an interesting bit of warmth to the cobalt. It's a very neutralized color, kind of a kind of a warm gray, but I'm going to add this up in this corner up in here. Just let let that just flow because it's very wet. And then as we get down towards the barn to the, the rooftop, I want to have some trees back there. So what I'm going to do is take a little bit of uh, perylene green. If you've got any kind of dark green, you can see it's just kind of a very rich deep dark. Add a little bit of uh, turquoise to that. And I'm just going to throw in some darks. Take a little bit of burnt sienna. Burnt sienna and ultramarine blue makes a nice dark. You can see what I'm doing here. And I'm just going to drop this in right down into the crotch behind this, this rooftop so that it gets nice and dark. It's still very, very wet. This is the advantage of working on 300 pound paper is it stays nice and wet. And you can see having that dark come up against the, uh, the edge of that white snow capped rooftop, it creates a nice little bit of dark. Now I'll come back as this starts to dry, I'm gonna come back in and add even more darks. I might even take a little bit of Payne's gray a little bit of that green, drop that in there. A little bit of Windsor blue, maybe. These are just darks that I have in my palette. And because I've already got everything started here, you can see that it's just adding a little bit of dark right up against that white edge just creates a kind of a soft darkness. Now I'm going to have a, a bit of dark back over in here too. So I want to do the same thing, but I've got a big puddle of water. So always do your water management, wake up those extra puddles and then go back in and get dark again. Add a few little darks to accentuate and, and add value contrast. And then maybe there's a tree back in here, a pine tree. I'm just going to Put some darks around it. Go back into my that violet. And because that's just sitting there, I'm just going to take one little half squirt with my squirt bottle and that just moves that water across. So that's that's as far as we're going to go with this sky at this point. Come back to my sample painting. You can see we've got a little bit of cool cerulean over here. We're still pretty damp. So I could do that just to make a few little adjustments to make this sky a little bit, uh, uh, what do you call it, cooler. That's cerulean, and I'm just throwing it in between these trees. 
and put a little bit of raw umber with that cerulean as it comes down behind this uh, the rooftop to get it a little darker. And what this is doing is I'm creating negative shape for these tree trunks. And I can tip my board and let that run uphill a little bit. I'm going to flatten my board out, take those rolls of tape out. Take Bradley, a bit of could you repeat your green mixture, please? Um, where? Over here? I, I used a little bit of uh, uh, perylene green and raw umber. I also used a little bit of cerulean blue and raw umber. All of those things work together to keep it uh, primarily on a cool palette but um, takes it down a little bit darker. You don't want to use a raw green, that's too warm, but this, this is kind of nice. Now, I lost my pine tree in here, so I'm just going to take a tissue and blot some of this, go back to the white back in there, just with a little tissue. I can just pick that right up, not a problem. Now, if you need to clean up the edges along the rooftops, you can take a small uh, or a medium-sized uh, round brush, and you can pull some of these darks right down into the uh, where the edge of the rooftop is. Just little adjustments. That's all you need to do with the around. But I like this dark that I've got in here with the perylene green. It's pretty dry. I took a little bit of Windsor blue and perylene green, and I made this pretty dark right up in here between the trees. Now that the, the water is starting to, uh, the shine is starting to leave this a little bit, I can come back with a slightly drier brush full of paint and I can put some dark shadows where, in, where the trees would be in shadow. Now all I did was take a little bit of raw umber and perylene green and Windsor blue, got a really nice dark. And I just dropped a few of these dark uh, brushfuls of paint into the uh, um, the dark background of the sky where the trees would be, just so you can start to see some of the shadows that will eventually appear and be a, a strong dark. But at that point, I'm, I'm going to stop here and let you guys play with this. I've got a, I purposely left the upper right area fairly light in value with my brush. I clean my flat, wipe all the water off, clean it, rinse it. I can squeeze all the water out and I can come back in and I can kind of move some of this paint around gently if, uh, if I want to pull a little bit of value up into that area. But uh, I'm going to have trees up here that are dark. So I want my sky to be a little bit darker or lighter in value. And that's why I did that. All right. And then I, if I've lost a little bit of the negative shape, I can squeeze all the water out of this, this flat brush and I can just drag it upward along the, the, the trunk of the tree and just pick up a little bit of that, that white paper while it's still a little damp. And it does a pretty good job of just giving me a lighter area where these tree trunks disappear up into the darks of the foliage that we're gonna do later. Um, while you're painting, I'm going to keep talking. I'm going to let you do this. So if anybody has any questions about this, we're going to decide or see very quickly that as this dries, it's going to get lighter. And you may want to come back and make adjustments later after it starts to dry. I'll show you how to do that later. But don't be, a, don't be concerned if it starts getting too light and you feel like you haven't got it dark enough. We'll, we'll constantly be going back and adding dark because when we put snow falling snow over this, it acts as a filter. So you have to have your sky pretty dark where it comes up against these negative shapes in order for it to feel like, you know, falling snow. So uh, that's something just to be aware of as, as we move ahead. Um, I just, I'm taking a little bit of uh, blowing snow across the top of the roof here, just with a little bit of a tissue. I just kind of ticked a little bit of that off of the, the corner of that roof to make it look like snow blowing through there. Um, everybody's probably been caught out in the wind in a snowstorm, and you know how, you know, flurries of snow blowing across a rooftop can almost obliterate everything behind it. You just don't see it because of the mist and stuff. So 
what was it? Oh, one of the things I wanted to talk about while you're painting is even though you have white snow and the bottom third of this painting is the snow in the foreground, but we're only going to preserve the white snow of, of a little bit of a pathway that gives us an entree or an entering area or pathway of light that takes us into the painting. The rest of this snow is going to have a lot of color on it. It's going to have blues and pinks and, and some warm like yellow okras and different different colors because snowdrifts cast lots of shadows. There's also places where people have walked in the snow and they've left footprints. Each one of those gives the illusion of, of little divots of uh, color that and it's all very light in value, but it it basically really um, creates the illusion of real of a field of snow without leaving having to leave it completely white. So that uh, kind of is is where we want to go with this. I'm just squirting this with a little bit of water because where I took that tissue, it it started to dry too abruptly, and I wanted to have softer edges there. So <clears throat> we'll see if we can it is it's softening now you can see you can control a lot with a brush just very gently if necessary so um we're going to want to get this to even this looks dark right now because it's so wet but when all that water evaporates and dries it'll be 50 percent lighter so as the paper starts to dry a little bit we're going to come back and keep adding darks because we really need to take that down in value. And if you start getting an area that starts to uh, leave a dry area or a bloom, while it's uh, still slightly damp, take a very, just slightly damp brush and you can kind of smooth it out before it has a chance to settle down. Um, <clears throat> for instance, right now, I want to add something that looks like trees back there. I'm going to take a warm green, like a cadmium green light or a golden green, and add a little bit of raw umber to that and just throw in a little bit of, you know, some warm colors. And it's almost an oily consistency. I don't want it to be real wet. So I'm mixing up a little bit of raw umber and some golden green and just throwing them back in here into this damp area. There's some light areas and some dark areas, and then I'll come back in with a little bit of uh, cool. And the cool would be cerulean blue and raw umber. It's a very neutral cool. I don't want to get it too wet. <clears throat> and I'll just drop some of that in there. And what happens is I'm just blended up into the sky. So we don't know whether it's trees or, or uh, what it is. It just all gets lost in the, uh, in the overall um, flavor of that sky. I'm going to take a little bit of cobalt blue, a little bit of raw umber, and come right in with a flat brush right off the top of that, that uh, the rooftop, that negative shape, and really drop in some nice darks now. You can see this is a little oilier in consistency. And you can, when you get to this point where your paper starts to lose its shine, you can come back in with drier paint and add more darks in a couple of places to indicate that there, maybe there's some trees that are going on back in here. They don't have to be fully defined. They're just kind of implied back there with dark shapes in the mist and the snow and the blowing weather. Um, as that starts to, uh, again, lose a lot of the shine, we can take a sharp tool, like the back of a brush handle if it's got a bevel on it or um, a credit card corner, and you can sometimes put in some, some tree trunks just by scraping away some of that. And that little bit of white will show up later. We'll come back in, put some other things in there just to kind of suggest that there's bits and pieces of trees. You can always go back in with a, a, our little uh, medium round or small round and get a dry dark. And when I say that, I'm gonna get a burnt sienna and an ultramarine. Those two colors are gonna make a lively dark. Don't get it too wet because then it'll bloom, but you want to have it pretty dry. 
and I can just drop this into some of the shadow areas within the trees just to create some nice darks variety within those tree areas. Right up against the, the edge of that snow, as dark as I can get it. That's kind of nice. Now we've got a, a pine tree. It's uh, at least I had it in my other one. I'm going to come back in and put a few darks up against that tree just to kind of imply that there's some something going on. Get a little bit of the cerulean blue to that and just blend that out into the rest of the sky. Wipe off my brush so it's dry and just blend this away. But what that does is it just suggests that there's a, a lighter shape over here behind the barn. And I'll get a little couple of darks in there that suggest the, uh, the shadows behind it comes down between these guys. And, and you notice I couldn't do this when the, when the paper was completely saturated with water, but right now it's, it's a lot, it's lost that shine, which means it's starting to dry and I can drop in dry paint drier paint and it will stay dark. And as I use a little bit more of the, the uh, cerulean blue, it stays on the cooler spectrum instead of being too warm. Can even get a little ultramarine in there if necessary to really add some nice darks. Maybe come in around over in here. Now, just to lift some of that paint and move it around naturally. I just give it a half a squirt with the mist and it just starts dissolving the edges and allowing them to flow into the, the lighter areas. So you don't really see a transition, you just see a hint of some white back there that might be snow on a pine tree. Um, so if you, you know, I'm always be looking at your painting as you're doing it and step back a little bit away or lean back and take in the whole painting. Is everything working? Are we getting a nice smooth transition from dark to light? If, you, if it's too abrupt, go back in with a, just a slightly damp brush and just feather this back into the, uh, the rest of the, the sky. And I think you'll have, uh, you'll be a lot more pleased with it. I'm gonna add just uh, now that I've got everything down, uh, just I'm gonna move my palette over here so you can see what I'm doing. I'm taking a little bit of that bright violet you see how it's it's not really bright, bright, but it's as I mix it into my brush, I can now take this and just add some nice warmth into my sky. Take my mist, give it a shot, and now we'll just let that sit. And that little bit of bright violet is going to add a hint of warmth in that sky. And you notice I've got this nice little light variety in the in the sky here. So there's some. Randy, someone's asking what can they use instead of the gold green and the other green that you were talking oh, about. Oh, um, you can use a little bit of, uh, I, I suppose, a little yellow ochre with uh, a viridian or hooker's green. You could take a little bit of uh, cobalt turquoise light and add a little bit of um, yellow ochre to that. You could use cadmium light green. There's any number of ways to get it. It's just just giving yourself a lighter, brighter green, not a not a deep dark green. And um, here's a here's a way to do that. Let me show you. Where'd my brush go? I use this this big brush. I'm going to take a little bit of yellow okra. You see how that's got some brightness to it. And then I'll take a little bit of uh, cerulean blue. See how that has a, a, a lighter value. It's kind of a neutral, but it's, it's very natural looking for vegetation. Yellow okra, cerulean blue. I think most people have raw sienna and uh, cerulean blue. They can make that work. Okay, does that, does that help? Hopefully. Now, I'm looking at my sky, and we've already introduced an amazing amount of dark. We've got some beautiful mid-tones. We've got a lot of rich color in that sky. The next thing we're going to do is focus on our darks for the siding, 
on these barns because that's a strong, strong element that really gives us the, the beat to where we want to go with this. And again, a flat, I'm going to use a one inch flat instead of one and a half. And I'll use this brush to start building these shapes. And if we go back to my sample painting again, you can see that the, the barn that's closest to us on the left is a little bit lighter value. And then we, we transition into this middle barn that has a much darker value, but there's oranges and there's uh, raw siennas in there. There's raw umbers, there's burnt siennas, there's lots of colors. There's even some greens in there, lots of different colors. But overall, that shape is darker than the barn on the left. You notice how the barn on the, the, in the distance gets lighter as it tucks in behind the middle barn? We have to be very aware of allowing that light to filter in between these buildings from wherever. It's like bounce light, reflected light, same, same with these. And that makes this the darkest against the lightest, which is our center of interest. Okay, so with that in mind, I wet my brush and I'm gonna get some um, <clears throat> raw umber. Get my palette over here so you can see what I'm doing. A little bit of raw umber and some orange. And um, the orange is my transparent orange by Schmenke. Raw umber is by uh, American Journey. It's just kind of a cooler orange. And I'm just, I'm going to come in around this fence post, come in underneath the, the eaves that have snow on them. And my brush is wet. I want to make sure I have a nice smooth snow drift at the base of this building. So I use my flat to kind of come in along that, that edge. Now that's all the same. So I want to add some darks to this. I'm going to take a little bit of ultramarine blue. And I will over here on the, the, Edge here, I'll just introduce a little bit of blue in there. Clean my brush. Get a little bit more orange in here. Clean my brush. And then just allow the edge of my damp brush to start pulling these colors over so they kind of flow in that entire shape. But I've got a, a, a transition from a cool to a warm with a little bit of red in there. That red is the orange underneath the eave and the ultramarine is what's giving me this nice rich dark in there that, that, that provides a little variety maybe some of it comes in right behind this snow drift but because that shape that i've just created is so wet i can now get all these different colors to blend on the paper and not worry about you know brush strokes there's enough water there that the water moves the pigment and it'll and i'm going to take this lighter pigment and drag it right into the shadow in the snow drift which we'll see later but i just want to give a little bit of that color to come right down and reflect in the snow i'll take some darks and drop a little bit of that in in a few places just to to make sure that we've got variety within those uh those shapes. And I can tip my board because I'm, I've got my paper mounted on a board and I can let the water flow across the wet surface of that shape. And it'll drag these pigments and allow them to blend naturally on the paper by themselves. I'm going to do the same thing over here on the, the far distant uh, barn. It uh, We're going to use pretty much the same colors. We'll stay a little bit lighter, as I mentioned, in the back because there's uh, bounce light coming through there. I'll, I'll come in behind the snow drift. And this is where the draftsmanship comes in. You want to make sure that you've created these shapes ahead of time so you're really true to your, your composition. I'm going to take a little bit of that same color and come right in between the, the, the shapes, between these trees. And each one of these shapes are a little bit different different proportion, different edges, different uh, scale. But now that that's all wet, I'm going to add a little bit more of the cobalt, a little bit of the cerulean blue, keeping it on the cooler side right in here. I want this to get a little darker. So I really have some nice 
contrast between these tree trunks. And I can always add a little bit of orange to that to warm it up in a couple spots. I'll add a little bit over here. And then get a little burnt sienna mixed with uh, cobalt. I, I, when, I, when I say mixed with cobalt, I'm basically taking a warm and a cool and mixing them together to get a neutral. And depending on how much warm versus how much cool I leave in the mixture determines whether that wash goes to the warm side or the cool side. And because there's so much water on this shape, it's very wet. These colors just kind of naturally flow within that shape and create their own little blend. I can't control exactly what it's going to look like because the water is doing that. The water is going to control exactly what happens. I'm going to add a little bit more cobalt down at the base behind the snow here, just so that it feels a little cooler as it comes down behind these trees. And using the flat, I can come right up against these tree trunks and just drop a little bit of color into that wet puddle and get these beautiful little um, variations in warms and cools on the surface of that building. We read that as we look at now, you know, you, you step back and you're looking at this entire building. Um, I see the whole building reading as one building, even though it's interrupted by all these different negative shapes of the trees. And it, uh, it has a nice cohesive feel to it, even though we've got lots of different colors going on inside that. So I want you to just have fun with this and understand how water will grab these different pigments and move them naturally across each shape and they'll start blending on their own. And as that water starts to evaporate, the water is literally moving these pigments. I'm gonna take my board and, and shift my board a little bit so that that water flows across these different pigments and creates its own blend. Um, th this move, picking the board up and allowing it to the water to kind of run is about all the control I can exact across this. I, other than that, I really have very little control. It's, it's all basically the water doing the work. And you'll hear in watercolor, you know, letting the water do the work. This is what we're talking about. We're letting the water move that pigment so that it creates a really nice um, blend that's natural, spontaneous, and feels uh, really kind of interesting. I'm going to throw a little bit more warmth up into this puddle up here underneath this eave just to get that orange going so that it feels like it's continuing on across. All right, <clears throat> let me back this over so you can see it. And I'll let you do that. We're gonna do the middle barn last. I wanna let these lighter shapes that come up to the barn in the middle dry before we put the, the edges on, on the middle barn because they have to be darker. And if I get too, uh, do it while it's too wet, that dark is gonna run in and we're gonna lose the edges of our left and our right barns. So <clears throat> just let these kind of dry. And uh, while I'm letting this dry, you're doing the painting. So we'll give you a chance to really jump right in and experiment and play. And just remember, we're not in control. It's the water that's, that's moving the paint. We're letting the painting kind of paint itself just by introducing the right types of color um, into these shapes while they're wet. The water is what grabs that pigment. It moves it across that shape. You've already done your planning. You've created uh, little individual shapes that are all different and varied. But when you add the value across these, even though they're interrupted by these negative shapes of the tree trunks or the telephone poles or the fence posts, we see the entire building. And uh, this is why it's so important to do a value study, because that's where we, we create this in our head. We start seeing this as a shape and we understand that, oh, as a watercolorist, I have to preserve the white of these vertical shapes that interrupt the siding on that barn or the fence post here. And, and But I can let the same color kind of run across all of these, these little shapes to create the illusion of the side of a barn. Now, while you're uh, you're doing that, I'm gonna take my heat gun 
and accelerate the drying process here so that we're ready to go on to the next step. Um, hopefully we'll get this dry enough so that I can uh, come in with some really nice darks for this middle barn and make that really pop. And where we have our darkest darks against our lightest lights, that's going to be our center of interest. That's where our eye will gravitate to because it's like a stop sign. It just stops us right in our tracks and we go right to that, that one place where there's the greatest value contrast. That's another reason why we always wanna do a value study so we can decide you know, on a little piece of scratch paper with a pencil uh, where we want those darkest darks to, to reside in our painting to take the viewer's eye to where you want them to look. I think we're almost dry here. So hopefully you guys are uh, moving along with your little warm shapes of the sides of this barn. <clears throat> we'll probably come back and make a, add some darks to these barns. But for now, I want to make sure that these, the left barn and the right barn have a little bit lighter wood tone siding than what we're gonna do with the one in the middle. The one in the middle is really gonna be dark. So uh, to talk a little bit about preparing for that middle barn, I'm gonna take my flat. I've already got a number of different things mixed up here in my palette. I've got some nice darks right here where the greens were mixed. I'm gonna start with that, but I'm gonna add a little bit of ultramarine blue. Ultramarine blue always takes things down in value. I'm gonna add my burnt sienna to that to warm this up a bit. So now I have basically a nice rich chocolate brown. If it gets a little too warm, I just add more ultramarine. But you're just regulating this going back and forth between a warm burnt sienna and a cool ultramarine. And you can create a very lively dark. Now I, I do want this to have a bit of warmth to it. So I'm gonna use the flat. I've got, it's not real wet, because I wanna use the flat edge of the brush to get in underneath this overhang that's got snow on it and really get it nice and dark. But while it's damp now with uh, this brush stroke that I've just put in here, I'm gonna add a little bit of water to my brush and add some orange to this, just to really uh, drop in some rich warmth into that wet area. Then um, maybe get a little bit of sap green. I don't know. We'll try a little of that, see what happens. A little bit of that lighter green color. It's too wet, so it's not showing up. So we'll get a little bit of uh, green in there. And then raw umber. As we come in, we're getting some bounce light up against the edge of this rooftop. But then as we tuck in behind this barn, I want to go back to my ultramarine and burnt sienna and really get this nice and dark. So that it feels like this barn in the middle is tucking in behind the barn in front of us. The warmer, I don't know if any of you have heard me say this before, but warm precedes, cool recedes. Whether it's a cool dark or a light dark uh, or a light cool, it'll always kind of step back in space, whereas a warm light color will come forward. So there's, uh, and I'm going to add a little bit of cobalt to this just to really pop this as a cool down behind this uh, barn. And then carry that same color on the other side of the, the telephone pole with this flat. And it, I just feel like I could cover a lot of ground with this flat brush. And I wanna get right in underneath my snow drift behind this uh, fence post. And the fence post is, why did I put a, I mean, there's no reason for these vertical posts to be there. I added those strictly to create variety and interrupt a uh, an obvious repetition of a pattern here. I wanted things to uh, have a little bit of interruption. And it just seemed appropriate since I had fence posts in other places that I could do it here as well. Now I'm going to take some raw umber. And I had some cobalt there, so the siding was starting to get a little cool, so I'm going to a warm. And I always go back and forth between warms and cools, warms and cools. Uh, putting a little bit of, of blues in there, then I'll add a little bit of uh, warmth in there. I'm going to put a little bit of uh, orange in there right underneath this uh, overhang. Come up next to this fence post in the halfway down. <clears throat> 
and I'm, I'm starting to get a nice puddle going here. And the puddle of water is what moves this pigment along. I'm going to get some darks down low. I'm going to add a little bit of green. And we'll add, uh, you know, green is just a, another color to add to add interest. We don't know what, it, it, maybe it's a reflection from trees or something else. It doesn't matter. But just try not to be too predictable in having all the same colors. It's more important to go back and forth between warms and cools. And uh, if you can introduce, you know, a variety of these, it just becomes a very rich painting with lots of interesting things happening. So let's get this a little warmer up underneath the eave and then darker as it comes down towards the snow. Add a little ultramarine and burnt sienna, mix that in my palette so it's nice and mixed. And then as we get down to the base, everything gets darker as it tucks in behind that snow. <clears throat> now I want this to be a little bit darker over here on the corner compared to the barn behind it. So I'm adding a little bit of burnt sienna in here. I'll add a little bit of the, the uh, uh, a cool color, maybe a little bit of cerulean blue. And you can see, I can take a, a small round that's just slightly damp. And I can move some of these colors around and manipulate them. I don't like to do this too much, but sometimes when you're working in a tight spot like this, it's, it makes sense. I'm going to take a little bit of lavender and just pull some of this right into that, that little crevice where the wind has created a, 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 a drift around that the base of that. I'm throwing a little bit of lavender into some of these wet areas just to see what happens. It just kind of is, uh, repels some of the paint and creates interesting textural effects. I kind of like what's happening there. And, and I'll tell you what, you could paint this painting 30 times and every one of them would be different because the water moves differently uh, on every painting. So everything we do, we have to kind of step back, evaluate, see what's happening and let the painting kind of speak to us and lead us on what we want to do next, how we want to proceed and where we want to introduce color. I, I think this needs a little bit more warmth in here. So I'm going to add a little bit of orange in a couple of spots here just to kind of keep it warm. But then I'm going to go back with my ultramarine and counterbalance that with some darks. <clears throat> now I can take, because there's a lot of water there, I just pick up my, my board and let that water flow up into that shape and let it just kind of naturally do whatever it's going to do. Um, I think we're, uh, we got a nice solution here. I'm going to get this a little darker over on this edge where it's closer to the viewer. We want this to be, feel like it's coming towards us a little bit more as opposed to the barn behind. The other thing that I can do now that I've got this uh, color on my brush, I can come back in and paint the, uh, uh, the little bit of uh, this, this dormer that's showing the, the barn behind here. I'll just add a little bit of that dark in there. It doesn't need to have any edges or anything. It's just a shape. <clears throat> we'll leave that alone. Might come back in and get a little darker over in here. Now, um, I said that we might want to come back and darken some of it. So I'm going to actually take my brush that's got a little bit of this dark on it, clean it, and then just feather that dark shape down into the, the rest a little bit so that it just behind those trees, it gets a little darker. You ever drop your brush? Mine just rolled under the table. <laughs> I had to chase it. Okay. So I'm going to give you guys a chance to really finish this up and get the sides of these barns done. So you've got some really nice darks. Um, I'm looking at this now as I've stepped back away from it. I can see that the barn itself is gonna dry too light. So this is where you go back in and you make any adjustments. Ultramarine, burnt sienna, it's a really nice, uh, rich dark. I'm gonna just come back in to this end and right in behind this telephone pole 
with a little bit more dark. <clears throat> Clean my brush, get some drier orange, and allow that orange to kind of come down in behind there, get a little bit more dark. There we go. Now I feel like it's quite a bit darker. All right, we'll let that dry. This is still just a giant puddle of water on this shape. And that's allowing these warms and cools to all kind of interact by themselves. And the water is kind of moving through this shape. And when it dries, it's going to be a really nice, rich, glowing color. It's not going to be opaque. It's not going to feel uh, overworked. You're not going to see any brush strokes in it because the water is, is really moving and lifting that pigment and allowing it to flow across the shapes. And, and the orange mixes with the blues and the greens. And you, you get a much more natural uh, effect in, uh, in what we're doing here. So I'm just I'm going to see if I can get a little bit of green in here just to kind of we'll leave that alone. Leave it alone, Randy. Step away from the painting, as they say. And I'm going to uh, dry this so that we can keep moving. But I like what's happening. Just had a thought, this might be a good, good opportunity while it's not quite dry. I might put some slats in the side of this barn just by scraping away some of this. Some few highlights here and there. You never know, <laughs> just sort of an experiment. But the, the uh, this middle so barn how thick is your paint dark. is on the barn. Say that again. Someone's asking how thick your paint is on the barn. What's the consistency of your paint? Well, it got pretty thick, but it's mainly because I used uh, a fairly saturated brush full of, of pigment, and then I added water on top of that to to flow. The water is now evaporated, and this thick paint that I had initially is is settling down into the tooth of the paper and it's it's pretty thick it's uh but it but it's feels very spontaneous because the oranges are flowing into the cooler colors giving us a nice glow and let's see if i can zoom in on this a little bit can you see how does that help seeing that up close like that you can see the reflection and the shine over here on the left that's still very wet. That's just the the light from my lamp reflecting on the wet surface. So there's there's still a lot of wet, damp surface to that. But the the water has moved all that pigment around and created this nice bit of glow. Let's see if I can get this back down. There you go. All right. Um, I think probably the next thing we need to work on will be our foreground. And then we can go cut back into our uh, negative shapes for the rooftops. Those we want to save those for the the final uh, part to be the brightest white, even though we'll knock some of it down a little bit, but not much. It, we have to save the rooftops for the very end. So that leaves this giant foreground of snow, and we're going to have to create a lot of interest in that. So how do we do that? We have to bring a little bit of warmth, even though it's a cool painting. There will be some warmth in those cools. By that, I'll be using some, some uh, quinacridone rose. I'll be using a little bit of yellow okra. I'll be using the bright violet and the Windsor blues. All of those things make violets that are just really very rich. Underneath this grove of trees that's over on the right, um, we're gonna probably have some shadowing because the canopy that we're going to create at the top of these trees doesn't let as much light hit the bottom. So it gives us an opportunity to put some a little bit more mid-tone value 
and neutral grays and stuff in underneath these trees, which gives us contrast for a nice pathway of light that leads us into the painting. So there's a lot of thought that goes into, you know, composing a painting so that it makes sense, it, it pulls the viewer in, uh, and we, we control that by deciding where we put our washes that have a little bit more neutral to them, some that have a little bit of more warmth to them, and then we can start putting in the little footprints and the divots and the, the recesses that create shadows that create dimension in this bank of snow that's across uh, behind this fence. So, um, Lois, maybe you can see, does everybody uh, look like they're caught up here? Are we doing okay? Or do we need a little more time? I think people look as if, uh, yeah, they all... yeah, a number have finished. Yep, 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 yep. Okay, well, let's talk a little bit about what we're going to do next then. Um, I think probably the, the, the uh, a good thing to do would be to very delicately work from lighter to darker midtones. And we'll start with a little bit more warmth over here on the, the lead in to the left side of our painting. And we'll end up with a little bit of cooler, darker neutrals on the right side with a nice light pathway in the middle. So I'm thinking that um, I've got all these darks in my palette. Let me back this up a little bit. And, and it's kind of muddy, muddy. So I'm gonna take my squirt bottle and create a little space in a couple of these places to mix, take a tissue and just kind of clean this out so I can get a really transparent, clean wash for my snow that isn't real dirty. I wanna have a nice, rich warmth in there. So I'm just gonna clean up an area so I have a nice place to mix my paint. Uh, because I want these to be pretty delicate um, washes. All right, using uh, my big flat, I'm going to get enough water on there. Start with a little bit of lavender. Lavender is kind of a nice base, it's, but then I'm going to add a little bit of bright violet to that. See what happens here with that. See how that just gives me a really transparent glaze. Add a little bit more value, uh, lavender, maybe a touch of cobalt. Yeah, I like that. All right, get it nice and wet. And I'm going to come in with a little bit of this just in a few spots. It's not like, and I'm going on dry paper. I'm, I'm just coming down on either side of this telephone pole, the, the uh, leaving the whites for the fence posts. And then where I've left these nice wet brush strokes, I'm going to go back in and pick up just a touch of quinacridone rose. It's similar to opera, but it, it's not as fugitive. And I can drop in just a little bit of warmth in a couple spots, a little pink there. And I don't want it to be too saturated. So I'm just kind of allowing it to uh, come settle down to the as a bead to the bottom of the, the paper there. And then I'm gonna pick up a little bit of, of uh, cobalt. And cobalt is decidedly bluer than what I had there. So I'm gonna, in a couple of spots, I'm just dropping in a little bit of this cooler cobalt. And I'll add water just on the corner of my brush to these, um, what do you call them, the, the, the little, marks of blue that I put in there so that they just gently kind of flow into the, the rest of the shapes without leaving a lot of hard lines. And I'm just going to pull this on down and let the, the some of the blue tint just run vertically right through some of these spots. <clears throat> you can see it's there's no real science to this. It's just being fearless and dropping some of your brush stroke full of this light glaze down onto the paper. Now, <clears throat> we want this to be a very gentle transition right in here. So I'm just going to clean my brush so it's just barely damp, no pigment on it, and just come across here and just grab those edges and lighten them. Now I can come back in with a little bit of cerulean blue. Cerulean blue is a little bit warmer than the cobalt. And I'm going to, and it's also going to granulate a little bit more. So I'm going to add 
just what appears to be a little bit of shadow in a couple of spots. And because that is already wet, when I touch this with the cerulean blue, it just kind of flows and feathers out much like a wet and wet painting. And I'm gonna also take a little bit of uh, turquoise, get it, I'm mixing it so it's just a glaze, adding a little bit of that, that's gonna warm up some of the snow here in the foreground. It's, it's warmer than, than cerulean, but it just knocks us down a bit. And that's a pretty, I mean, there's, we still see the white shapes of the snow banks. That was a mistake. Pull that brush right across the side of my barn and I can pick it up and soften that edge gently. But you can see what's happening. I'm, I'm basically allowing these, these very light, um, delicate glazes to move across the painting. And now let's get a little bit of bright violet in here. That's too bright, so we'll water it down. And in a couple of spots, I'm just adding bits of, of warmth in there with the bright violet. And then maybe a little bit of lavender in here a couple spots. I'd even take a squirt bottle and just hit it once just so that it that water lifts that pigment off the surface of the of the paper and lets it flow naturally across the paper. Now you notice I have very subtly and, and steadily kind of moved a, a very slight value with the edge of my brush right up against that telephone pole and this fence post. So that we now have a little brighter white where the telephone pole and the fence posts are. We can just sense or feel that coolness on the white surfaces where the snow is. And I can always take a brush that's just clean and I can pick up bits and pieces of, uh, of some of that value. So it has variety going across. Once that's done, I'm going to move over to the other side and we'll get a little, little more uh, neutralized, a little more, not quite as bright a color, a little more neutral grade down cools. But before I do that, I want you to paint this side and feel happy with what you've got. Uh, always be sure to wick up any excess moisture around the edge of your painting so it doesn't creep back in when you're painting somewhere else. But I think what's really interesting about all these things that we're doing is we're getting a lot of uh, granulation and texture within our, our washes. These paints all interact with each other and the this, uh, sedimentary pigments, even in the more transparent uh, stuff, all granulates and it leaves a nice texture in the snow. I'm gonna clean my brush. I have this uh, kind of a calligraphy brush, take all the water out of it. So it's just damp and I can come back in and pick up a little bit of the, uh, create some variety and some separation between some of these washes so that we just start to feel there's bits of light, fingers of light kind of wicking across this surface. But um, you can see a little bit of, uh, let me zoom in here. You can see little bits of bright violet, which uh, are pretty subtle. They're just little bits of warmth there. The lavender is kind of a steel bluish gray. We've got some uh, turquoise and, and some um, warmer green colors in there that are just all kind of running. And, but they're soft. There's no, there's no edge or brush marks on here. The water has moved these pigments around to create these nice effects. So that's, that's where we are at the moment. We will get ready to attack the other side in a, as, after you guys have had a chance to successfully put some nice transparent washes of color that are very, very subtle, not too saturated, very diluted um, glazes on the left side of this foreground. We yeah, want to maintain... A... Somebody around here about the um, darkness of the barns. 
She wonders why the left-hand side of the right-hand barn is light when it should be in shade. Uh, you back you, here? Yeah. That's, that's bounced reflected light, and it creates a contrast and makes it feel like it's lighter in value, so it goes back a little farther than the barn that's darker that's closer to us. And it's just an optical thing that we create as painters to create the illusion that that's farther back, and maybe there's there's just bounce light back there that, that pushes it back into, into the distance a little bit more. The, the richer, more saturated darks make this feel like it's coming forward, the middle barn. So, and I purposely left the corner of this far left barn lighter in value so that that dark felt like it was tucking back in behind it. Those are just visual um, uh, techniques to create volume. And, and dimension. All right, what I'm gonna do over here is work with a really big, uh, it's not that big, it's an inch and a half flat. Um, if you've got a larger flat, this would be the time to break it out. And I'm gonna mix up some cerulean blue and raw umber. The raw umber is warms this up, but it also neutralizes things. So I'm gonna add, a little bit of the cobalt, a little bit of cerulean, and a little bit of the raw umber. And now I've got a nice glaze fully mixed into my brush. And I'm gonna, um, where's my sample? I wanna come down with a little bit of color in between some of these trees here. I wanna just get this in here nice and, and then just get a little wetter as it goes up behind them. And then, Add a little bit of raw sienna or raw, what do you call it? Uh, yellow okra, raw umber, a little bit of uh, the, uh, the, the uh, bright violet. The bright violet with that yellow okra and raw umber just neutralizes that immediately. Come down behind these trees. I want to uh, get lots of water in here. And then we've got some places where the uh, the dirt, I'll use ultramarine and burnt, burnt sienna. And we've got little bits of darks in here in a couple of spots. And we'll just let the water kind of move this stuff around. But this is the, the little bits of shadowing and, and stuff that are in all this terrain that's down here. And I'll just drop some of these colors into these wet space uh, shapes in between the trees so that we have a nice bit of stuff happening. It's not really decipherable, but it, it just shows that there's some highlights in there as well. Clean your brush and come back up behind this and just sort of very gently kind of fade it away or feather it away into the background behind this pathway up to this other barn. We want, we want the brightest white to be right down here in the foreground. We wanna pull some of this this neutral color right up in the background here. So that it just doesn't really upstage anything, but we're getting lots of really nice textures. Uh, we got some, I'm gonna take my brush and just sprinkle some water on this stuff just to get some blooms going. And all of that is just gonna be really rich. We'll get some of this lavender mixed in here. We'll add a little of, the, of that in there so that it's more like shadows. And then pick up a little bit of the, the uh, umber. And I'm gonna just take a squirt bottle and just the bottom corner here, I'm just gonna soften it with a little spray of mist. But I think that's, that's working. I don't know if that's gonna be, you never know exactly what you're gonna get, but you have to trust. So I'm gonna add a little bit more of the mixture of cerulean and raw umber just to get it a little darker in a couple of places. And I think that's gonna work pretty well. Here's a little bit of cool cobalt. And again, I'll take a, a rigger and just sprinkle a little water on there for texture and see what happens. Excuse me, Randy, 
this yes. this um question has already been answered but i'm afraid i'm still confused okay um you've scratched some branches in on the back in the left and also on the timber house and um i tried to scratch mine in but i got really dark marks so how do you get those <laughs> you know why you got dark marks because the you the paint had not dried sufficiently you were still uh, very very wet and what happened is when you scrape that, all the water that was in that shape flowed right into those little grooves that you scratched and it darkened the paper. That's why, you know, when you scratch out limbs on a tree in the background, it's all about timing. You have to really watch the shine on that wet shape. And when you start to completely lose that shine, but you can still see that it's kind of has an oily consistency, that means that the water's fairly evaporated, but the paint is still wet. So when you think of like a bulldozer uh, plowing out a road, you, you push everything aside and there's not enough viscosity to flow back into that trench. Well, if you use a very, a fairly fine little wedge, can you see on the screen what I'm holding? This is a little acrylic brush handle. It's got a fairly small um, round wedge to it or bevel. And I can use that to scrape away that oily paint and there's not enough water in that shape left to flow back in. And what I've done is I've exposed the white of the paper. Um, unfortunately, and this happens to me all the time, I jump the gun and I'll try to do it too soon while the paper still got a lot of water on the surface. And that wet paint just goes right back into that little groove that I've made and leaves a really nice dark mark because I've scarred the paper then. And uh, and then you go, oops, <laughs> should have waited a little longer. And with trial and error, you figure out, you know, you get more and more successful at doing that until you reach a point where you can really judge the surface of the paper depending on what angle the light is shining on your paper so you can see whether it's lost that really high gloss shine that when the surface is really, really wet to when it starts to turn into a semi-matte finish. And once it starts getting towards that semi-matte finish, then you can scrape out, you know, tree trunks, fence posts, you know, whatever your, your intention is in creating these little accents marks of, of revealing the white of the paper. Uh, it's a neat little technique that we can, uh, that we can use as painters. Um, it's not something that's necessary all the time, but it's, uh, it can work to your advantage. All right, now I'm getting a big flow. Everything's flowing down here and I'm, I'm kind of keeping an eye on this. I, I've got to come back in and wake up this uh, this painting. I'm not all adverse to that, that little flow I got. It kind of follows the terrain, but it's a little bit too regular. So I'm going to try to uh, get some drier paint that's maybe some uh, um, cerulean blue and a little bit of raw umber and maybe come in behind this one tree with a, a couple of darks that suggest other shadows and, and things that are in here and break up what might be construed as something that's very um, predictable. We don't want to see predictable shapes. We want to have things look natural and spontaneous and nature doesn't do things in symmetry. It's always asymmetric, asymmetrical. I'm going to add a little bit of, of uh, warmth in a couple spots just to create variety maybe hit it with a little squirt and let it because it just starts flowing that way away from the um the deposit of paint you can always help it a little bit by having some things running downhill this way too but now that feels a little bit more natural i want to come in behind some of this other tree with some some darker marks here just to make it feel like there's um, I don't want to have it too, uh, too predictable. So I'm just trying to feather some of these marks out so they're not obvious. Okay. I think that's okay. Now, um, we'll let that dry. I'm going to, uh, just not worry about that at the moment. We'll need to move into another area, another, another place. As we get back up towards this building, I want this tree trunk, this negative shape, to be a little bit more obvious. So I'm going to pick up whatever I have here in my, my painting, uh, in my palette, and I'm going to come in on either side of this tree with just a little bit of tone 
and then clean my brush and feather those edges away from the, uh, and what that did is it just made the, the tree trunk a little brighter just by putting a very subtle amount of value on either side of it. So now we can actually see the tree trunks as negative shapes. I can see that I've got a hard line here. So I'm just gonna come in with my brush and just soften this down a little bit, pick up a little of that paint. Now I wanna talk a little bit about, um, I'll come back to this when I do it, but I'm, while you're painting this and, and getting this all done, there's something in painting called alternation. And it's not a term that I think brings to mind what the, the purpose is, but if you have, a telephone pole, a fence post, a tree trunk, anything that's vertical. As you look at it in nature, <clears throat> if you're looking at a telephone pole or a power utility pole that's up against the sky, the sky is very light in value. Excuse me, you see the, the pole as a darker value. But as it comes across something that's very light behind it, say a snow-covered rooftop, all of a sudden, uh, we'll see that as a dark value. But as it comes across a dark value, say the siding of this barn, all of a sudden, um, I, I think I maybe have mixed that up. You're going to see darker value on the pole if you've got light behind it. If you are going against a dark background, it's going to be a negative shape. As you come down into the snow field, you're going to have more darks on the pole because what's behind it is lighter. And a vertical shape will change from dark to light to dark to light, depending on what's behind it. So as you are aware of that, you can be, be very painterly, you can create a very loose interpretation of a telephone pole, a tree trunk, just by introducing some darks and <laughs> preserving some lights. So we wanna uh, be thinking about that as we prepare to do these trees and poles and fences. Now, the next thing, I'm touching my painting. The sky is completely dry. So rather than pull around down here where I still have a very wet foreground, I'm going to move to a different area and, and change gears for our next step in the painting. What we're going to do is create our, uh, our foliage or the canopy of these trees. And to do that, <clears throat> I'm going to use a couple of brushes. I've got a nice... Uh, calligraphy brush that I just got for Christmas. Santa Claus brought me something that was interesting, a set of three. I uh, haven't used these a lot, but they, they are kind of useful in creating nice flicking effects. I'm also gonna use this mop brush to get most of the, the value for the trees in. When I paint these tree tops, I wanna use, I wanna hold my brush back on the back end of it. I don't wanna hold it like a pencil because then you don't have, you're too controlled and too stiff and everything is too tight. So if you hold your brush back on the back of the tip, you're painting with your entire arm. So we'll mix up some, some cooler colors. I don't want these to be too, too warm. This has got to be fairly cool against that dark sky or that light sky. So I'll, I'll get some of the perylene green. I'll get some ultramarine blue and I'm gonna get enough water to mix all this in with some uh, raw umber. And I'll get a really nice kind of rich, deep green color, but it's, it's almost a neutral, it's so dark. And I wanna have enough water in my brush <clears throat> that it flows off the brush, but it's gotta have enough pigment in it as well so that it stays dark. So I've got a pretty good mix in my, fully in, enriched in my, uh, mop brush, and I'm gonna come back in and just sort of start putting these, these dry brush effects across here where these, these tree branches are. I'm gonna introduce more cobalt, so I get a little bit cooler in here. And we'll get ultramarine, a little bit of burnt sienna, but more ultramarine, more on the cool side. And you can see what happens. You can get some really nice dark effects in here with this and I'm just kind of going the way the branches would go. I can take my squirt gun, give it a shot and it softens those brush effects. 
And now I'm going to take this uh, this calligraphy brush and get some of the, the warm green. It's like a golden green. And we'll mix that with some cerulean blue. And I've got some nice brush strokes that are on the warmer side at the bottom of this tree. And we'll just allow those to kind of all blend together very softly. And then I can go back with my ultramarine and get some really nice darks into this shape in here. And I can always use the tip of this to create little branch effects that are coming off of these tree trunks. But more importantly, I want to get a nice, cool, um, maybe a little Windsor blue with some of that bright violet. We'll get some nice, rich darks down in some of these shapes. Clean my brush and then get a little bit of raw umber just to get some variety in there. We Again, we're adding warms and cools, mostly cools, but a few little warms here and there just to kind of create interest. And then as we get farther down, I'm going to get more of the, the cooler colors and just kind of come across these with a, a just some nice breaking that up a little bit. And once this starts to dry and I start to lose the shine, I'm going to come back in with some drier brush pieces to create stronger brush effects. This is the background that creates the tops of the canopy there. I'm not trying to uh, do a finished uh, rendition of trees. I'm trying to lay in some some the basic parts of it first. One of the one of the things we're going to want to do is uh, poke up into these these uh, into the the negative shapes of the buildings with these tree these uh, fence posts. So I'm going to take a rigger and I've got just a, a big long skinny rigger and I'm going to try to get a little bit of drier paint on this. Ultramarine and burnt sienna. You can see that that's too wet. So I'm going to go back and, and try to get just there. See how dry that is? That that's I've got a lot of paint on this. And I got big chunks of, of warm. I've got some chunks of cool. And I'm just going to lay this down on some of these fence posts. I'm not trying to be perfect. I'm just trying to give little scratchy darks that interrupt all of this uh, this white field of, of snow. And then I'll take a little bit of dampness and, on a clean brush and pull some of these colors across the surface of these fence posts. So we have some really true darks. And then we have some mid-tones. We've got little bits of everything in here without being too obvious. And I'm not trying to be too careful. I'm just trying to, to create a variety of uh, stuff. And I'm going to, now that I'm down at the base of this guy, I'm going to put a little bit of dark, cool color. I use a little bit of blue. I'm going to rinse my, or squeeze the color out of my brush and allow some of this to just kind of come across the, uh, the field of snow. Pull some of this down as a darker, cooler color in part of the fence post. And then once we get down into the, uh, the, the field, there's a little divot around the base of this where the wind is hollowed out the snow. And I'm just taking some water that has a little bit of cool color on it and poking around this and just putting these subtle little um, shadowy areas. And I'm just picking up whatever's in my palette, dropping a little bit of color into these shapes. So it feels like there's a little bit of hole around the base of these uh, these fence posts that the wind has hollowed out. We can always take a little bit of bright violet in a few spots. <clears throat> and then I don't want to have too much water on my brush, so I'm going to pick some of this up, wipe it off on a rag, and then I'm going to use the edge of my, my brush to create just some, some little uh, rough, scratchy areas in this, this field of snow. Come back in and get a little bit of, of uh, um, cerulean blue, drop it in the leading edge of some of these so it's warmer on the backside, darker on the front. And we start to see little 
uh, shadowy areas where there's some um, deviation or, or recesses in the snowbank without being too obvious. And these, there's no, there's no rhyme or reason to this. It's just trying to lay this down gently, subtly, create a little bit of value behind this fence post so that we start to see. And then also the telephone pole is going to have the same type of uh, situation. It's going to be a little cooler, closer to us, a little warmer on the back side with reflected light. And if that's too much, you just take a tissue and pick it up. It's just not, not a big deal. All right, we'll come back in and do the fence post later, but right, right now we've got a, a nice little rendition of these, uh, these fence posts. I'm gonna add a little bit of orange to the tops of these just to kind of clarify where the, the, uh, the top is of each one of these. But now there's a variety. I've got warm, I've got cool blue, like ultramarine blue. I've got some burnt sienna in here. Uh, I've got a lot of different colors within the little, little trickle of color on these fence posts. Um, and then as we come back out, and I'm going to take a dry brush. This, this brush has never been in water. It's just, and I'm just going to use this to kind of soften the back edge of some of these shadows. Um, if you get something that looks like it's starting to bloom or is a mess, just take a dry brush and use it like a, a sweep or a broom and just whisk any of the, the blooming away and you'll be fine. Um, excuse me, that looks pretty good. My trees are still pretty wet. <laughs> I think I need to dry those. So while you're doing your shadows and your trees, I'm gonna be drying. And then we'll be able to come back in and dry brush these boughs and put some nice texture in there. Some of the things that uh, you can do is maybe there's crevices where the snow just didn't quite fill in or the, the snow blew across a retaining wall and left just hints of something in there. I've come back in and, and just in, in, in a couple of spaces laid in some, uh, some darks in here just to kind of suggest that maybe there's, there's some, uh, something in the uh, back in there that's part of the, the bank and uh, it, it works, but I'm always looking for opportunities to create a little bit of, of uh, variety. Now I'm going back in with a little bit darker, just a, a step or two darker in value in a couple of spots to create these little um, uh, shadowy areas, divots, textures in the snow banks. It's not really all that critical, but it just gives, a, it defines the terrain a little bit. And you can do as much or as little of this as you want, but I just do it with a rigor because I'm not trying to get too careful. I just want to throw down a few little marks on there and that takes care of that. Now, <clears throat> we talked about um, the, the tops of the trees. I'm going to take this, this pointed brush that I've got. It's like a calligraphy brush, Japanese brush. Maybe it's a Chinese brush. I don't know and uh, get some dry pigment on here. I'm gonna work with uh, cerulean and a little bit of uh, raw umber. You can see how the blue and the raw umber make a green. And I'm gonna just get, get some, some little branches that are starting to show through here in a couple spots. I can use the side of the brush. I can use the tip of the brush. I can actually get some, some little uh, marks in here that look like branches. I can clean my brush and get a warmer mix. Um, maybe a little bit of brown. But I, and I can also take a smaller, where'd my small brush go? Lost it. 
Oh, here it is. I have a, a really small little Japanese brush and it I can take a dark color and it's almost like a, a uh, what do you call it, a, a rigger. And I can put just some swooping colors back and forth that are reminiscent of some of the, the little fine branches you have at the base of the, the foliage. And that works. And we talked about the fact that some of the places we might have to go back and darken, we're definitely going to have to do that. So somebody was asking me earlier, why did I leave this so light? You don't know how light it's actually going to dry until all the water has, has evaporated. And this area back here needs to be just a little bit darker. So I'm going to come back in and just darken it just a tad, not much, but just enough to uh, tuck it in underneath that snow. And I'll use a little bit of the blue in my palette, in my mixing well, just to drop in underneath that overhang. I'm still leaving it lighter, but it's it's just a, just a hair darker. And then the tree area back in here, I want to get that nice and dark. So I'm going to just take some of this nice rich greens that we did. And in a couple of spots, I'm going to just drop in some really rich darks that I used on those boughs and use a flat and come in behind my telephone pole. Got too deep into my rooftop, but that's all right. Um, and why am I doing this? When we put the following snow on here with a little bit of gouache, it's going to lighten that by 50%. So I want to make sure we start off with enough um, dark to really make this all read. And so that's why I'm adding some really nice darks back in here. Almost like there's trees back there. We don't know what they are, but they're they're going to read as a nice bit of dark. Clean my brush. I'm just going to soften that a little bit. All right. This needs to be darker also, and it needs to be a little warmer. So I'm going to use raw umber and a little bit of the um, cerulean blue. Get enough water on my brush and just create a, a nice little swatch of uh, dark. And that just pulls the foreground towards us. Maybe add just a bit of, of uh, bright violet to that. All right, <clears throat> soften those brush strokes with just a little bit of water. And now we've got the, the rooftops. So I've got to deal with those. Those have to be pretty, pretty pale. So I'm going to take a damp brush and I'm going to just basically put a little bit of water on that white and allow the edge of the roof to kind of bleed down into that white so that it's just sort of a little bit softer edge. And I want to leave the white of the where the snow is on these fence posts. So we'll add just a touch of dark or, or glaze up against those uh, the uh, telephone pole. So now it reads. And then I'm going to get a little bit of cobalt and just put a little shadow on the bottom of the thickness of the snow that's, that's piled up on this roof. And we'll just allow that to just sit there. And it just creates the illusion of some thickness to that snow. Now, the other, uh, the one on the left, I'm just going to take a damp brush, clean, and pull some of the dark from the trees behind it down onto that, and then put a little bit of uh, warmth, I'm not warmth, the shadow on the bottom of the snowbank that's riding along the eave there. And then over here, behind this, I'm going to get a little darker. I'll get a little bit of cool right in between these, these trees using cobalt more of a glaze than anything, and just punching up those 
negative shapes of the tree trunks. So we see them as brighter than the far distant negative shape of the roof. It's a, it's a pretty quick little glaze that we're putting on here, but it makes a world of difference. It just gives the dimension to those negative shaped rooftops. All right. If you feel like you've got too much, you can always take a tissue and lift a little bit of it too. But I think that's probably pretty good. And that last thing we're going to do is the the tree trunks and the and the telephone pole, and then put some snow on this. So um, I'll let you play with the rooftops a little bit, punch up your uh, punch up your your negative shapes or your your telephone pole. If you have a hard edge on some of these areas that are coming down on your roof, just take a stiff brush that's clean and feather the edges of any glaze that you put on there. And you can just soften things up just that quickly. I'm going to uh, lift a little bit of this trunk here, a little bit with a stiffer brush, just up into that tree area. You can see how quickly you can re revive or restore a negative shape for a tree trunk or a vertical. <clears throat> it's uh, kind of nice to be able to just lift with clean water and a stiff brush a little of that negative shape. My uh, telephone pole here, I kind of did a boo-boo when I was doing it, painted over it. So I'm just gonna lift that right out of there and clean it up, pretty easy. How are we doing? Everybody about ready to go on to the tree trunks next? I think that's our next step. And I'm just going to make sure everything's dry before we try to paint over these negative shapes against light background. So we dry this and then we can come in and put a nice scratchy dry brush bit of dark. Now for the dark marks on your verticals, you can use any brush you want. You can use a little narrow flat like this. I happen to have an old Randy, oil brush. Randy, I've got a, a couple of questions for you, please. Sure, go ahead. Mm -hmm. um, someone's saying they don't understand the addition of the branches at the top. They don't they have don't what? Seem to the scene. What made you add them? Say that again. I'm sorry. They don't have what? They don't, they don't understand the addition of the branches at the top. They don't seem to fit the scene and what made you add them is the question. I, I, it just kind of keeps our eye in this area. It's a device just to create a, the tops of the trees with some long skinny trunks underneath it. Um, it's a figment of my imagination. This whole thing I made up, so it doesn't really matter. But um, as far as getting the darks on our verticals, what I'm gonna use is an old oil brush. And it's a very stiff, scratchy brush. I cut off the back end of it because it was such a long brush handle, didn't fit in my brush holder. But what I'm gonna do is just barely get it damp. And I'm gonna get a little bit of uh, ultramarine and burnt sienna and create a real oily dark. And I'm, I'm going to come in and in a couple places, put this kind of dry brush effect of these darks right on, the tree trunks where they're uh, in front of a, a light background. And I'll go back and forth between, you know, ultramarine cool or burnt sienna warm and create these nice little marks that suggest that the, the tree has uh, some dimension to it. <clears throat> Doesn't have to be the same all the way. We, we just put a little bit of this in here in a couple of spots. And, uh, and that just makes them feel like, okay, we're seeing parts of this through some of the trees and we're, we're seeing bits and pieces of it. Um, and then I'll take a small brush with that same mix and I'll put maybe, you know, some old, branches that are coming off of this that are we can see against the the white snow we've got some darker branches up above that come up into the 
the treetops. See if we can get a little darker. Got to get more pigment on here. All right, there we go. And then I, I just try to ground them a little bit with a little bit of uh, dark down around the base of these trees. And I'm not trying to be real perfect with any of this. It's just kind of establishing the, the ground base. Accordingly. A little warmth, a little cool. And then I'll use that same mixture. Got different things coming out of the snow there. <clears throat> and then for the, the uh, um, wire on the, uh, maybe there's some old wire on these fence posts. They're kind of curling up and dropping into the snow. Someone's asking if they could have a quick pause, please. Sure. Go ahead and. Uh... Now, as this all has dried, I, th I think I need to go back and I'm always evaluating, trying to decide, do I have enough value? Do I need to uh, introduce something different? Uh, and I'm going to put a little bit of Windsor blue and this bright violet and create kind of a, a glaze of lavender and really kind of darken this a little bit over in here because I want this to have feel like it's closer to us than the back in here. And if I can just introduce slightly a little more value, I think that helps. I'm going to clean my brush and just soften this and let it just flow right across the foreground here as a, as a nice warm wash. Now, as you look at that on the screen, we feel a little closer to this area and this feels a little more distant. It's lighter in value, it's receding away. This, this still feels like a light snow field, but it feels closer to us. And it's got a variety of warms and cools within it. It's not uh, exactly, you know, a flat surface. There's got a lot, there's a lot of contour to it, a lot of things happening. So, add a little bit of blue in that wet area. We <clears throat> can soften this a little bit. Um, my, my negative shape for this um, building and it started bleeding down. I want to soften that a little bit so it's just not quite as, as uh, obvious. There we go. That looks better. Um, I'm, I'm fairly happy with the way this has gone. I need to build up my, uh, my, my telephone pole. I'm going to get some warm colors in there. We'll start with a little bit of uh, raw umber and come across here with that. Maybe add a little bit of burnt sienna and then possibly some ultramarine blue. As this goes up, it just, we start to see a little bit more value. And I want to cool this down. So I'm just going to use some junk that's in my um, palette that's a little on the cooler side to create the bottom of this um, telephone pole where it recedes down into the, the snowbank. So that'll be a little darker. And we got some darks going up. And then some of these tree trunks up in here, we'll add a little bit of dark here and there for those. Rinse my brush so it's just damp. And then I'm just going to dampen some of these marks so that they're more organic looking and not like a brush stroke. We just want to make sure they're kind of dry brushed and in there. 
Um, I want to get at the base of some of these, these uh, fence posts a little bit of darker dark down in the snowbank because there's shadowing areas there. It just grounds them and it anchors them coming out of the snow. Now they really kind of pull our eye back into the painting as a leading device that kind of directs our, our view. I'm going to uh, take my rigger. This is a long skinny rigger. And I'm just going to get a little bit of uh, ultramarine with some burnt sienna on it. So I have a nice dark. And I'm going to create a few little, uh, what do you call it? Barbed wire, wires on the fence that are maybe kind of not doing too well. They're, they're barely there. They've, they've uh, fallen down into the snow. But it just adds a little bit of loopy texture that also reinforces kind of pulling our eye into the painting. We can also take that whatever's on our rigger that's left and drop it onto the base of some of these trees so that we have a, a little bit of value coming off of these guys. All right. Next thing we got to do is uh, get a different container. Do you have a, if you have a mat board or if you have a plate or you have anything other than your palette available, I have a little separate thing here. I'm gonna I'm mix up a little bit of white gouache. I'll put a little bit in the in this uh, palette. And before I, I start mixing this up, I wanna make sure that everything is dry. So I'll take my hair dryer, or in this case, it's a heat gun. And the reason we went so dark with this building and so dark with these trees and dark with the canopies up here and dark in the foreground beneath the trees is so that uh, splattered white gouache will actually be readable as falling snow. Because if you splatter white gouache onto white paper, you're not going to see it. It's just not going to show up. The only place it'll really show up is where we've got these nice dark values. So I'm going to take my toothbrush, not the one I used this morning, but um, this one, and add a little bit of water to the toothbrush and just kind of mix up a, a kind of a nice little mixture. I've got different values of different consistencies of it here. And don't hold your toothbrush right over your painting because if a big blob of this falls off and leaves a you know half inch wide uh, splatter on your paper, it's not gonna look very good. So hold it a little bit away and gently with your thumb, kind of tickle the edge of the, the bristles on your toothbrush. And you will be able to start placing splatter over some of these darker areas. And all of a sudden, you have falling snow. And you can put a little bit more down on some of the foregrounds that are darker, because that's closer to us. We're going to see probably more of it. Definitely have finer spots. See what happened here with this? That was where I got too much water and not enough uh, paint, and a lot of gouache. But if you catch it when it's still wet, you can uh, wick up any big drops that, that might be sabotaging your painting but I would definitely go back in and put a finer spray over some of those dark trees. And that's, that's like a little filter that filters our visibility of what's going on. And you can make bigger droplets with drier paint and, and get bigger splatter and have smaller splatter. You can have you know, a lot of variety to this, but it just creates a beautiful effect of a winter snowscape. And I think it, it just enhances the overall atmospheric effect that we're after. And once this dries, you have to decide where you want to paint, where you want to tie in your painting. But um, I would always either, if you're going to use white gouache, sign it over a dark area. If you're going to use, say, a violet, a little darker violet, sign it over an area that's got a light background. But your signature should also have the same character of texture that uh, you've uh, you've already introduced in the painting. The um, I always consider a signature 
to be part of the painting. It's, it shouldn't be something that's so abrupt or so jarring that it doesn't feel like it belongs. Uh, and I always try to keep it level. I know some people will sign a painting at an angle and it just kind of is so jarring. It doesn't feel like it belongs in that, that uh, landscape. So um, it's always important to, to make the textural effect of your signature be part of the painting. Now, before I do any signing or signature on this thing, I want to make sure everything's dry. Uh, you can look at this and, and really read uh, pretty well what's going on. If you wanted to put a little bit of telephone poles in there, you can do it with either a gouache and, and, and a rigger, or you can use magic eraser and, and create a very thin little loop that goes up to that telephone pole and, and create that effect. So it's really your preference. I'm going to try it with a little bit of this, this gouache, see if we can't get a nice uh, loop. Again, I'm holding it out on the end of the brush, and we'll just kind of get some, some lines that are coming across. We don't know what necessarily they might be. We'll put a few little things up there. Anyway, um, I think in this case, I'm going to use, to sign this, I'm going to mix up a nice, rich violet. So we'll use that bright, bright violet and a little bit of Windsor blue. And I will uh, create a nice, cool color that's already been introduced throughout my painting. And I'll come back in here and I'll just, I, I think I'm going to use a different brush. I like this smaller calligraphy brush. I think it works a little better. Um, and I can come back in here and It's, you know, my paint, my signature doesn't really stand out. It becomes part of the textures within the, the painting. And then it's not a distraction, <clears throat> but it's there. So you can come back in and put a few more marks in here. If you feel like you, you want to add a few little things. But essentially... That is the painting, and that's how we arrived at, at these snowbound buildings that are uh, getting snowed in.